Okay, hello. Um, can people hear me? All right, so um, are there any questions about uh, the uh, like administrative matters or anything like that before I start talking about Hobbes? Okay. Um, so I'm not going to start by saying more about Hobbes' life because um, there's so much reading to talk about and I don't think what little I have to say about it is actually that helpful. I'm just going to start talking about this book. Um, maybe at some point other things about his biography will come up. Uh, oh, can I go over the homeworks one time, please? Um, um, well, I will, you know, before the first assignment is due, I will talk about it in more detail. Is, is that okay, or is there something you want me to say about it now? It's, uh, it's just, okay, all right. So, um, yeah, one thing I do, one general remark I do want to make about the book, and I guess uh, maybe I should have said it last time, by now, if you've been reading it, you've noticed that, of course, Hobbes' English is a little bit different from our English. This was written a long time ago. Um, and so, uh, um, well, number one, you just, you know, it makes it a little bit harder to read. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful not to assume he means the same thing that we do by a certain word. But also, uh, you should know that if, at least if you're using this edition, and I think the one the library has is the same as this. I didn't check, actually. But if you're using this edition that I ordered, there's a glossary of Hobbes' language in the back. And every time there's a word in the text that is in the glossary, there's an asterisk next to it. Right, so in other words, whenever he uses a word where they think that you might not know what that word means, or you might think you know what it means, but you'd be wrong because it means something different. In the 17th century, there'll be an asterisk next to it, and you can look in the glossary in the back for an explanation, which I encourage you to do. Um, okay. So my plan for today is just, uh, number one, I'm going to say something about the overall plan of the book, um, partly based on what Hobbes himself says in the introduction. And then I'm going to, maybe I should write these up here. So... First to talk about the overall plan for the book, and then to talk about um, three specific important things in the reading for today. So one is Hobbes' Metaphysics and Epistemology. As I mentioned before, right, metaphysics and epistemology are parts of theoretical philosophy, not parts of practical philosophy, but the different parts of philosophy are always connected to each other. And so, um, we, you know, one of the ways they're connected to each other is um, evident here because Hobbes has to discuss his views on what kind of things there are in the world and how we know about them. Um, uh, in order to explain what he thinks human beings are. And he has to do that in order to uh, explain how human society should be organized. Right? So that's topic number one. Topic number two, which I guess in a way is part of metaphysics here, is 
Now, this is only the first time I'm going to talk about this. It's going to come up again and again. What Hobbes is saying about God and religion. Um, you might ask why there's anything about God and religion in this book. Uh, and uh, whether you would ask that or not, it would be a good question because I think there's two different reasons. Right? This is something that, uh, this is a puzzle kind of that's raised already by Aristotle. He says, you know, which is the science that rules all the others, the ruling science? Is it, I mean, I'm combining two things he says in the metaphysics and the, and the well, in the ethics, Nicomachean ethics together, but is it, um, metaphysics or first philosophy which tells us about the best and primary things in the universe in particular what he calls the gods right so is it is that the ruling science because every other science gets its principles from that science or something like that or is politics the ruling science because Politics tells all the other sciences, decides how far they'll be studied and by whom, and you know whether they'll be allowed in the in our state or not. Um, and you know the answer to the puzzle is well, in, of course. Oops, what just happened? Well, that's okay. All right, the answer to the puzzle, as usual with Aristotle, is well, in one way it's one, and the other way it's the other, <laughs> but. Um, those two ways of um, thinking about God going together with politics are both in this book. On the one hand, um, uh, what you say about God is going to have an effect on what you say about everything else, like what the world is like, what human beings are like, and so forth. And on the other hand, um, Religion is a political, it's a feature of human society, um, and it raises political questions just like any other part of human society, and it's, you know, it's a particularly problematic uh, aspect of human society from a political point of view. For example, it tends to cause wars, <laughs> right? So, um, so Hobbes is going to discuss God and religion from both of those points of view. In the reading for this time, it's more the first one, and I will say something about that. And then, uh, lastly, the things about will and power and the passions, um, which are going to be the foundations of his whole political philosophy. Okay, so um, so I'm going to start with this first. So um, so the book is about uh, the state or commonwealth, um, but um, taken as he says. Uh, in the introduction as a kind of living thing. And um, apparently he means that it's literally a living thing. But it's, this is not just a metaphor. So if you look um, on page three, um, For seeing life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within. Okay, so this Hobbes is defining life here. He's saying, what does it mean for something to be alive? Um, it means that the motions of its parts depend on some principal part within. Um, 
This is actually not far from Aristotle's definition, but in any case, um, so the commonwealth or state is literally a living thing. I'm going to erase these things. But it's, uh, of course, a great big living thing. It's a living thing insofar as the motion of all its parts depend on some principle within. But it's a great big living thing. And that partly is the explanation for why he calls it the Leviathan. Um, right? The Leviathan is this huge monster mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Job, um, um, and a few other places. Um, some kind of huge sea monster, basically. Um, but, uh, but actually, this, the, the commonwealth is a, is a great big living thing, but it's not really a great big fish. <laughs> um, it's really a great big human being, or as Hobbes says, it's an artificial man. Now, what do I mean when I say it's not a fish, it's really a human being? Obviously, it's not shaped like either a fish or a human being, right? Um, but uh, the distinction Hobbes is, Hobbes is making here between non-human animals and human animals is that human animals are rational. Human animals have reason. And Hobbes is saying that the properly constituted commonwealth is not just a living thing, but it's a particular kind of living thing. It's rational. So it has reason. Um, that is, it can know things and, and decide what to do by, based on its knowledge, roughly speaking. So I want to say something about this phrase and the contrast here of uh, artificial man versus a nat natural man. And I just want to say this only because I wrote down in my notes that last time I taught this course, um, a lot of people who answered the first prompt on the first assignment got confused about this, which is that um, an artificial man versus a natural man is like a robot versus a natural human being. Right? It's a, that is, it's a human being that was made by human beings versus one that was made by nature. That's the contrast he's drawing here. I mean, I think that's pretty clear when you read it, but I, I just know that because he says so much later about what human beings are like in the state of nature, what they're naturally like, a lot of people got confused and thought that a natural man meant like a human being living naturally, living in the state of nature, something like that. That's not the contrast he's making here. It's just the contrast between what we would normally call a human being, a human being that's born from parents in the natural way, and this other thing which he's saying is, is a kind of human being or rational animal, but which is artificial, is, is not naturally generated, but is made by human beings, namely, and of course, it's not a robot, it's a commonwealth. All right, are there questions about that before I go on? Like I said, I'm only emphasizing this because I know people found it confusing. Probably the people who found it confusing didn't pay attention to the lecture anyway, so <laughs> it won't help, but I don't know. <laughs> in any case, um, okay, so in this huge artificial human being. I'm changing Hobbes' word man to human being. I'm not going to talk yet about what Hobbes thinks about the relationship between men and women, but that will come up. Um, but for now, I'm just like, uh, leaving aside the question of whether he's using man sometimes to mean only male human being 
sentence. I think sometimes he is and sometimes he isn't, but here he's basically using it to mean human being, and that's I'm just changing it to that. Right, so, um, so in this huge artificial human being, Hobbes says what the soul is. Um, the sovereignty is an artificial soul. Oops. as giving life and motion to the whole body. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, so uh, according to Hobbes, as I'm gonna explain in a moment, everything that exists, technically speaking, every substance is a body. Um, it's material. It's something that takes up space. Um, uh, so, um, the soul, according to Hobbes, is not something that's not a body that's kind of, like, added to the body of an animal or a human being. Um, because he doesn't believe that there are any such things, things that are not bodies. So, um... What is the soul, or sometimes he also calls it the form. This is based on an interpretation of Aristotle, a popular interpretation of Aristotle. The soul, or form, is the principle of unity in the body, the thing that makes us treat it as one body, basically, even though it has many parts that are moving around separately. And in the case of a living thing, we already know what that principle of unity is. It's the fact that the motion of the parts comes from some principal part within, right? That's what gives life to the living body. And I'm, this is important to, well, I think it's important to focus on the difference here. It's not the principal part, right? Say the principal part is the brain. The brain isn't the soul. The brain is just another part of the body, another, another smaller body that's part of the big human body. But the soul is the fact that the motion of the limbs um, depends on the brain. So it's not a thing at all. It's not a material thing or an immaterial thing. It's um, a fact about the body. And that's why, similarly, he says the soul in a commonwealth, again, it's not a thing, it's sovereignty. Oh, uh, someone has their hand up? Yeah. Yeah, does that mean, um, like, you could say the principal thing would be consciousness or self-consciousness or something like that? Well, no, I think he thinks the principal part is the brain. But you're just saying that it's you wouldn't reduce it to just that one. Oh, I'm saying the soul isn't the brain. Oh, so are you saying, could you... So, yeah, that uh, the soul would be consciousness or like conscious experience. Well, um... Maybe not. Well, I mean, it does involve what he calls consciousness. <laughs> yes, I mean, or it does involve having perceptions... Um, and having desires that result in actions. So if you call that consciousness, it's consciousness, right? That is, it's, it's, it's the fact that there's a central part that, um, that you know, uh, the way all the other parts of this body react to what happens in, to them in the world is all like, comes out of that central part. Okay. So, I mean, that's, I mean, it's like related to what we call consciousness, I guess. Consciousness, as you probably know, is a really slippery term, actually. <laughs> so, um, um, Okay, yeah, I was just kind of curious if they were maybe synonymous. Well, I mean, they might or might not be, depending on what consciousness means. But, you know, I mean, like, 
when you transfer this to the Commonwealth, right? Like if you ask, is a state self-conscious? Is a political organization self-conscious? Well, you know, I mean, um, according to Hobbes, according to what he means by being conscious, or uh, the answer is yes. It has perceptions, it has desires, it acts on its desires, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, uh, you know, if you're willing to go along with saying that a state is conscious for that, self-conscious for those reasons, then you can say that, that the soul is self-consciousness. If not, you probably want to say, no, it's not really self-consciousness because something that isn't self-conscious can still have it. <laughs> I, okay, does that, does that help? Yeah. So, right. So anyway, so the soul of the commonwealth is sovereignty. That is the fact that there's a sovereign. So, um, Right, so the, the soul of the commonwealth is sovereignty, and so to speak, the brain is the sovereign. That is, the sovereign is, am I spelling sovereign wrong? Can I spell brain wrong? Right. All right, <laughs> the, um, the, the brain is the I mean, sorry, the sovereign is the principal part which the motion of all the other parts depends on. So the fact that the commonwealth is a living thing is the fact that it contains a principal part like that, that all its parts depend on. Um, in other words, the fact that it contains a sovereign. And so the soul of the commonwealth is sovereignty. The fact of, that there's a sovereign. Um, okay, so there was one good question about that. Are there other questions? I'm going to say a little bit more about that, but because what I, what I'm saying or what Hobbes is saying here is kind of weird. <laughs> there might be questions. Okay, well. So, I mean, um, a question. yes, uh, I just, I thought you said that, um, the brain was just like another part of the body in general, and now you're making a link that brain, that the brain is sovereign. And is that because you say like that's where like this collective decision making kind of comes from that rules how we collectively move parts of the body? Is that the link you're trying to make? Yeah, you're right. The brain is just a part of the body, but it's the principal part, <laughs> right? It's the principal part. Um, so, um, principal with an A, right? Not principal with an with L E. The principal part is the brain. So you know the fact that the body is alive, a human body or or any other animal body. It's not clear what he thinks about plants, but anyway, um, the human body or any other body is alive because the motion of all the other parts depends on this principal one. Thank you. So, so right. So again, the distinction I'm making is between sovereignty and the sovereign, or between the soul and the brain. The brain or the sovereign in a commonwealth is a thing. It's a body, according to Hobbes. Because all things are bodies, according to Hobbes. The soul or the sovereignty is the fact that there is such a thing. You so in this analogy, would the brain be whatever is ruling the society, like the, the monarch or the oligarchy or the democracy? Right, so that's what the sovereign is. The sovereign is, in a monarchy, the sovereign is one human being, the king or queen. Um, uh, 
or just, I mean, or queen is not unimportant because England had a lot of queens in this period. Right? Um, so anyway, right. So the, if in a monarchy, the sovereign is one person, the monarch. In an oligarchy, the sovereign is an assembly of human beings, but not all of them. Right, so then the principal part from which all the, the motion of all the other parts depend is this assembly. In a democracy, as Hobbes and uh, the, well, at least as Hobbes understands democracy, let's, I'll, st I'll stick with that. In a democracy, the sovereign is the assembly of all the people. Now, you might, like, if you look at this picture here, you might ask yourself, so wait, in a democracy, there's no distinction between the brain and the other parts. But there is a distinction because, as Hobbes says, there's a distinction between a lot of people doing one thing as an assembly versus everyone separately doing something. So even in a democracy, the, in a democracy, you can't draw this, right? He's thinking about this abstractly. You can't draw it, but in a democracy, the principal part is, the, is everyone met together as an assembly and deciding by majority. The other parts whose motions depend on that are all the individual members on their own. Okay, so that was a good question. Uh, okay, good. There's now a Discord for this course. Uh, okay, I hope that's not too distracting, but anyway, if you want to have a Discord, fine. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, um, okay, was that clear? Um, all right, so um, to make this artificial human being, then what we have to do is put this soul or form or life into the matter it's going to be made of, right? That is, we have to um, replicate what uh, God is described as doing when he creates a human being breathing the soul of life into the, the matter, the earth, which the human being is made of. But of course, remember, that doesn't mean pouring in some kind of ghostly immaterial substance, right? That's one of the things Hobbes in this reading makes fun of as nonsense, the idea that you can pour spirits into, right? So um, it, it just means arranging that matter so that the motion of all the other parts will depend on the principal part. And the way God does that in the case of a human body is, I guess, by fiat, right? Let there be, you know, whatever. But the way the human artificers of the artificial human do it is, Hobbes says, by pacts and covenants. This is, this is his first mention of something that's going to be with us throughout this whole course, the idea of a social contract, a covenant that forms a commonwealth. The way all the motion of all the parts is made to depend on the sovereign is by all the individuals who are, who are the matter of the commonwealth that's coming into existence. Um, freely or under duress, <laughs> making certain promises, covenants with each other. Okay, so, um, so the plan of the book basically um, derives from this idea that the Commonwealth is a certain soul that is a certain organization imposed on matter which consists of human beings by human beings 
by means of pacts and covenants. At least that's definitely how you can understand the first two books, right? Because the first book is about man, that is, human beings. Because the first thing Hobbes says he's going to have to do is discuss the matter. And then the second book is about the common law. And in the second book, he's going to explain how this form can be introduced into that matter. The other three books are a little, the other two books are a little bit uh, less expected, maybe. Oops. Um, book three is about the Christian common law. And book four is about the kingdom of darkness. So um, why does Hobbes have these two books? Well, um, remember what I said last time about the English Civil War. The English Civil War, um, and like a lot of wars that had been happening on the continent as well, was at least in part a religious war. Um, and the people who defeated and overthrew and executed the king did it partly on religious authority. Um, and they did it in particular partly on the authority of the Bible. So, you know, uh, especially the Old Testament describes prophets as um, rebuking kings and sometimes um, um, making kings or replacing kings. So the Puritans in England, you know, um, who were big fans of the Old Testament, <laughs> uh, were, you know, read these stories and saw themselves in it. They said, you know, we are inspired by God and we're here to replace this wicked king with a righteous king or with a more righteous form of rule. Um, so basically, the point of part three for Hobbes is to explain that why, according to him, Christianity and the Bible don't introduce anything that changes what he's shown in part two. That they don't introduce some extra factor that's above the authority of the sovereign or the state. Um, and for that, partly for that reason, it, part three includes a lot of Bible interpretation. Now, I mean, we're not going to be reading much of part three in that's part of the reason we're not going to read part of much, much of part three. I think it would be too difficult to get into all the questions of how to interpret the Bible that, that, this, is, that this raises. His interpretation is not particularly plausible <laughs> um, as politically inspired interpretations tend to be, right? Um, so, um, um, but that's basically why part three is there. And as for part four, which sounds like it might be about Mordor or something, it's actually about um, um, the human deceivers who, who, out of their own self-interest, obscure the truths that Hobbes is trying to teach us in the book. Right? So he wants to point out where, what those people are doing and why and uh, you know, why we should not be fooled by them. Um, and that, again, uh, largely means religious deceivers, although not only, um, but it's, in this case, it's both Catholics and Puritans. 
Um, so um, anyway, that that concludes this this part of the lecture about the overall plan of the book. Um, uh, as I said, you know, most of our readings are well. I think the majority of our readings are actually going to be from part two, but most of our readings are going to be from part one and part two. But you know, parts three and four are in, important. If I had more time, we'd read more of them. But um, but we are going to read something from them. Okay. So are there questions? about any of that. Okay, so I'm gonna erase this and start talking about Hobbes epistemology and metaphysics. Right. So, um, so Hobbes' basic and most important metaphysical position I've already mentioned is materialism. Right? Um, um, and as I defined that before, it's the view that the only kind of things or substances there are in the world um, basically, you can think of a substance as a thing and that it has certain properties, right? Like, so bodies have shapes and sizes uh, um, and motions. So those are accidents of the substance. Um, it's probably not that important for this course as opposed to 100B and, or 100C to really keep track of what those terms mean. Um, but roughly speaking, you can think of it that way. So what he's saying is that the only kind of things are in the world are bodies, and the only kind of accidents or properties of things are the properties of bodies. Um, and um, Hobbes thinks we can be really certain that materialism is true, and so, first of all, so materialism is a metaphysical position. It's a position about what kind of things there are in the world. But um, Hobbes thinks we can be really certain it's true because, and this is an epistemological position, he thinks we can't conceive of anything that isn't a body. Um, right, so in... Chapter 3, uh, paragraph No man, therefore, can conceive anything, but he must conceive it in some place. And in, in endowed, or I don't know if that's pronounced endued or endowed, <laughs> with some, de it means endowed anyway, and endowed with some determinate magnitude, and which may be divided into parts. So um, that's basically a body. Right? Oh, sorry, that wasn't all on the screen. No man, therefore, can conceive anything, but he must conceive it in some place and endowed with some determinate magnitude and which may be divided into parts. That's what philosophers call a body. Right? A thing that is in a place, that has a size. Um, and because it's in a place and has a size, it also has to have a shape. Um, and... Um, and it's divisible into parts. And its parts are also bodies. Right? If you divide it into parts, you get smaller bodies. Right? So Hobbes thinks that um, we can't, we don't, literally don't understand the words of thing that is not a body. 
we can put the words together, but it's nonsense because there's no, we have no conception corresponding to that. Whenever we conceive of something, it has to be a body. Um, right? So this means that uh, materialism, um, the truth of materialism can't be doubted, basically. Right? To doubt it would be to think to yourself, well, I wonder if there's something that isn't a body. But you can't think that according to us. <laughs> you can say it, but you can't think it. Right? So therefore, materialism is certainly true. Um, now, uh, this is uh, not a popular position in early modern philosophy. It was a popular, and it was a popular uh, position in ancient philosophy. Not all ancient philosophers believed it, right? But there's certain, but there were large groups of ancient philosophers, Stoics and Epicureans, all, were materialists. Um, Platonists and Aristotelians were not, right? So, um, uh, but in early modern philosophy, it is not a popular position. Uh, um, more common is either some version of Descartes' substance dualism, right? Descartes says there are two kinds of substance, bodies and minds. Um, or um, in Berkeley and Leibniz and sort of in Hume, you get the view that there are no bodies, there are only minds. Um, but uh, um, Hobbes is the exception. So that's one of his main metaphysical positions. The other is one that he shares with um, with most other early modern philosophers, and that's mechanism. So um, this is roughly speaking the view that the only properties that bodies have are um, the properties that they necessarily have to have to be bodies, which I already mentioned, size, shape, place, and because of place, motion, which just means being in one place at one time and another place at another time. Um, and because they're divisible into smaller parts, they have some properties, if complex bodies that have different parts within them have some properties due to the arrangement and motion of their parts internally. But that's it. So, for example, color which is not on that list, is not really a property of bodies. It's really the way certain bodies seem to us when they push against ours. Whatever that means exactly. <laughs> um, but that's, uh, it means different things to different early modern philosophers. It's hard to understand what it means to Hobbes. Right? Like for Descartes, you can say, well, that's something that happens in the soul or in the mind, not in a body at all. But according to Hobbes, it's no, everything happens in a body. So where is that seeming redness? Well, uh, I don't know. And fortunately, this book, or unfortunately, depending on how you look about it, this book doesn't say anything about it because this book is not mostly about metaphysics and epistemology. Um, but that's Hobbes's position. So the way bodies can act on each other, there's only one way they can act on each other, and that's by pushing. Right? Because the only property they have that can enable them to affect another body is the fact that they take up a certain place and no other body can be in that place. So when one body moves, if there's already one here, it has to move out of the way. It's essential to a body to take up the place that it's in. So if it moves to another place, there can't, no other body can stay there. So it has to move. Right? And 
most early modern philosophers, until Hume, I guess you would say, um, take this as um, a kind of um, rationally comprehensible form of causation. We know exactly why a body can affect another body by pushing it. We don't know, we don't understand why it would it affected in some other way, like let's say by attracting it at a distance. We don't understand it and therefore it's nonsense, you can't maintain that. That's what mechanists think. If bodies, okay, so someone asks, if bodies are the only things that exist, what would Hobbes say about things without mass like light? Well, I mean, so first of all, mass, notice, was not on this list, right? Mass is a concept of Newtonian science. Newton is not a mechanist. Um, so when I said most early modern philosophers are mechanists, not Newton. <laughs> and that's why Leibniz and, um, and not only Leibniz, a lot of people thought to begin with, the Newtonian science couldn't possibly be true because they knew that mechanism was true. And Newton thought that bodies could affect each other at a distance. How is that possible? Right. So, um, um, but if you want to say something like, um, things that don't push other things out of their space or that don't resist other things moving into their space, like light, Hobbes will say, well, light couldn't be that because that's impossible. So what is light? Well, you know, I mean, he agrees with those ancient philosophers I mentioned about what light is. Actually, he agrees with Newton about what light is also. Light is very small bodies that we can't see moving through state space and um, eventually hitting the inside of our eye and pushing something in there, and that's what gives us our perception. Okay, so that was a good question. Are there, are there other questions about this? All right. Um, Right, so because it's because of this view that um, Hobbes defines perception or sense and um, um, appetite or uh, desire and aversion, passion, the way he does. He defines them both as kinds of motion. So sense is the motion produced in our body by other bodies pushing against our sense organs. Uh, I'm not going to put this up on the document camera, but I'll just read it. This is from chapter 1, paragraph 4. The cause of sense is the external body or object which presseth the organ proper to each sense. Either, either immediately or immediately. So either immediately means, you know, in the sense of touch, the very body that I think of myself as touching is the one that's pushing against mine. In the case of the sense of sight, the body that's pushing against my eye is not the body that I would say I'm seeing, but it's those little bodies that have come off it or that have bounced off it and then come into my eye that I was just talking about. Right, so we can say that in the case of the sense of sight, the body I see pushes my eye immediately, namely by means of these little light corpuscles, you know, that are emitted by the light source. They come streaming out of the light source, they bounce off this thing, and then they hit the inside of my eye. So it's, you know, immediately means by means of something else. It's as if the thing were pushing my eye with a stick or something. <laughs> All right. So, and so 
um, uh, right? This has to be what sense is because sense is something that happens to me because of the other things around me. And the only thing that can happen to me because of the other things around me is that they push me and cause my parts to move. Because that's the only way things can affect each other in general. Right? So that's the definition of sense. On the other hand, the definition of desire and aversion or passion or endeavor um, is that it's a very small motion inside me that may eventually result in a large motion of my limbs. Right, so in this case, um, we have that same picture again. There's the principal part, the brain. There's my limb here. And when my limb moves, when my limb moves voluntarily, because that is because of my desire or aversion, because of something I want or want to avoid, um, it, um, that voluntary motion of the limb depends on something in the principal part, that is, in the brain. But what could it depend on? Well, again, there's only one thing. Motion can only result from motion, because it can only result from pushing. <laughs> so if something in the principal part um, eventually got this limb to move, it must have been a motion itself. So, there was a little motion in here. And then the organization of the body is such as to amplify that little motion into the big motion of my limb. Just like in the Commonwealth, does this imply that there has to have been some original motion? Oh, there was, right, there was another question before that. So even abstract things like ideas and feelings and all that are considered bodies. Bodies or, so I mean, bodies or properties of bodies. Right, so like the shape of a body isn't itself a body. It's a property of a body. So that's why I kept emphasizing. We, it's, it's only he thinks that all substances, all like things, so to speak, are bodies. That like the the shape of a body isn't a body. The size of the body isn't a body. It's not right. In other words, it's not like to make this body be this shape. You have to add some other body to it. That's the shape. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so. I think what you're calling, you know, so things like ideas and feelings, well, I mean, ideas and feelings are basically, you know, um, sense and the results of sense or desire and aversion and things connected to that. And are they bodies? No, they're motions of bodies. Right, like it just defines sense as, you know, the motion that occurs in me because other bodies push my sense organs. And on the other hand, the desire or aversion is a motion that occurs in me that eventually results in the motion of my limb. So it's, it's not a body, it's the motion of a body. Now, so the other question was, does this imply that there has to have been some original motion? Well, um, Not necessarily. I mean, you know, the Stoics and Epicureans didn't believe that there was an original motion. They just thought the world had always existed and was always in motion. Right? So, like, what started this motion? Well, you know, so Hobbes does not believe. I mean, one of the other things on the list of things that he says are nonsense is free will. <laughs> it was also in this reading. Right? What started this motion? Well, you know, um, originally, 
I was affected by something through my eyes or I felt something or whatever. And, you know, um, that inside my brain eventually resulted in this desire to do something, right? So, like, I see a cake and therefore I want to eat it. <laughs> um, so, right, little little bodies of light bounced off the cake, pushed my eye, my eye pushed my optic nerve, my optic nerve pushed something in my brain, the parts of my brain pushed each other around and eventually there resulted this little motion which is the desire to eat the cake. And then assuming there aren't other desires that are stronger that, count, that, that contravene it or whatever, eventually that little motion will result in my hand moving out, taking the cake. I guess I'm eating the cake with my hands here. Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. Um, oh boy, I'm not as far along as I should be, but um, so I'm going to try to say this quickly, but this is also important. So, um, Everything that goes in between this sense and the eventual desire that may result in action, which is like thinking, um, imagining, according to Hobbes, those are the same thing. Thinking, imagining, all, what that all is, according to Hobbes, is decaying sense. <laughs> the thing that pushed my sense organs started some motions. And now, even though it's gone, the motions are continuing, right? Or even if, it, if it's still there, those motions have caused other internal motions, right? So like, um, you know, I see the cake, I imagine eating the cake, and then I desire to eat the cake. <laughs> so what happens in between is, a kind of um, like ghostly seeing of something that's not there. But Hobbes says that always, at least the parts of that always originally came from something I sensed. Because I, I've eaten a cake in the past, that eating that I started, that I did then, you know, caused certain sensations in me and they cause certain motions in my brain that persist. And that's what we might call my memory of having eaten the cake. But when they kind of combine with others, we can call that my imagination of eating another cake or something like that. So, so everything that goes on in my brain starts from sense. As Hobbes says, this is paragraph two of chapter one. The origin of them all is what we call, is, is what we call sense. So this is the beginning of the tradition of British empiricism, right? That we spend a lot of time, we spend all the time talking about in 100C. Um, right, the idea that everything that's in our mind comes originally from sense. Um, but, and this is strange, but I think it's true and important. Hobbes himself is actually not an empiricist. How can that be? Um, well, um, Hobbes thinks that all the thoughts that are in my mind are all sense sensations or the after effects of sensation. Um, but he doesn't think that any that I get any knowledge by sensing things. Where do I get knowledge? I get knowledge by reasoning from definitions. So, right, so he makes a distinction between science, which yields certain conclusions, 
which happens by reasoning from definitions versus experience or opinion, which comes just from having seen and otherwise sensed things in the past. And, you know, experience, opinion, prudence, those are very important, but they never have any certainty to them. I can't even be certain that the thing I'm looking at right now is really there. Um, at most, I get, I, I know that's highly probable. Why he doesn't go on that basis in the direction of Descartes and say, you know, maybe there are no bodies at all is a good question, but not a question I'm going to get into. I, I mean, not a question I know the answer to. <laughs> um, so, uh, but in any case, he says we don't get any certainty that way. The only kind of certainty we get, and therefore the only thing that's worthy of the name knowledge, we get by reasoning from definitions. So that means he's a rationalist, right? That position that all knowledge comes by reasoning from, from, from the content of our concepts, from our definitions, um, that position is called rationalism. Um, and moreover, you know, because it's from definitions, like all rationalists, he's stuck saying that all our knowledge worthy of the name is what Kant would call analytic. It's just unpacking the contents of the, of the definition we already had. So he thinks that's true of geometry, and he claims that's true of what he's doing in this book, too. Um... Okay, there was a quote I was going to read about this, about how um, people who don't know how to reason from definitions, well, should I? Okay, I'm going to not show it to you in the document here, but I'm going to read it. This is chapter 12, section 8. Is that right? Wait, that means it wasn't from the assigned reading. I think I wrote that down wrong. It's on page 65. Oh yeah, okay, I'm sorry. So this is from chapter 12, which was not part of the assigned reading for this time, but I'd read it anyway. Men that know not what it is that we call causing, that is almost all men. So what he explains causing means is that something is caused the cause of something else if by definition one follows from the other. That pushing of bodies is supposed to be an example or the example of that. By definition, since the definition of a body is it takes up a place, by definition, if it moves, other bodies have to move out of the way. <laughs> right? So, but men that know not what it is that we call causing, that is, almost all men, have no other rule to guess by but by observing and remembering what they have seen to perceive the like effect at some other time or times before, without seeing between the antecedent and the subsequent event any dependence or connection at all. Yeah. Right? So he's saying people who don't know how to reason from definitions are stuck being learning by induction, being empiricists. Not like me. <laughs> okay. Okay. That is all and more than I should have said about this. Are there, but are there still questions about this? So, well, one of my kids put my Hegel magnet on the, I think I'm supposed to show you the Hegel magnet. This is the Hegel refrigerator magnet. <laughs> I think I was also supposed to tell you something about it, but I don't remember what. <laughs> Maybe next time. All right. Um, so, uh, um, all right. So I'm going to go on to. Maybe I should not say much about this because I really have to get to the other part about 
will and power. The next thing I was going to talk about was God and religion. It, it, like I said, it is going to come up again. I guess... This is the main thing that's important to say about it now. Um, Hobbes talks about God a lot in this book. The very first sentence of the introduction mentions God. Um, however, um, Hobbes was a notorious atheist, right? Like everyone knew Hobbes was really an atheist. Um, so, um, how do those things go together? <laughs> well, I mean, there's different ways they could go together. One possibility is that people are using atheist in a rather broad sense to mean he's not a Christian, for example. Um, uh, even that, there's plenty in this book about Christianity, so they have to say, and I mean, this seems to really be the case about Hobbes, so we have to say that that part is not exactly sincere or that you have to read carefully between the lines to see what he really thinks. Um, but another part of the explanation is that if you read what he says about God in, in general, not just about Christianity or the Bible, you'll see that he says we can prove that God exists but then if you ask, what, what have we proved exists, Hobbes? He says, it's incomprehensible. Because he says, the only thing we can conceive of is a body, and bodies are always finite. So the only thing we can conceive of are, is, are finite things. In some other places, not in this book, he suggests that God is an infinite body. I don't know if... He's serious about that, or if that's supposed to be a contradiction in terms. But in any case, what he says in this book is that we can only conceive of finite things, so we have we can't conceive of or imagine God. Well, on the one hand, that sounds very pious, and it has a long history in philosophy of people saying things like that, going back especially to Maimonides, you can also raise questions about. Um, but um, uh, so on the one hand, it sounds very pious. God is beyond our comprehension, whatever. But on the other hand, it could be taken as a statement of very strict atheism. Because it means it's not just false that God exists. God exists doesn't mean anything. We don't know what that concept means. About Maimonides, uh, it's, I think it's complicated. About Hobbes, I suspect that's exactly what he has in mind. So when you go through this and see him talking about God this, God that, the, God the other thing, we're going to have to try to figure out what part of that he's serious about and what part he isn't. Okay. Um, So now, unless there's a question about that, as I said, we'll come back to this later. This will keep coming up. Um, I'm going to talk about, well, basically these things, good, will, and power. Okay. So to take good first, um, Hobbes is a relativist about good. Um, here's where he says this. This is chapter 6, paragraph 7. Uh, on page 28, the bottom. And okay. 
Well, okay, this is not the part I was looking for, but it's close enough. <laughs> but whatsoever is the object of any man's ap appetite or desire, that it is which he, for his part, calleth good. And the object of his hate and aversion, evil. <clears throat> right? So good means, when I say something is good, I mean it's the object of my desire. When you say something is good, you mean it's the object of your desire. So in particular, like if I say something is good and you say it's evil, we're not contradicting each other because I'm saying it's the object of my desire and you're saying it's the object of your aversion, right? And this is a version of relativism. It's an egoistical relativism, right? Relativism in general about any predicate, about any uh, word that describes things is the view that um, there's a, always a hidden relation to something else that you have to fill in to understand what a sentence using that word means, right? So like if you say um, this mountain is tall and you say, or you say this mountain is, is short and this tree is tall, that can be true even though the mountain is taller than the tree. Why is that? Because there's a hidden relation, because tall really implies a relation to something, right? When I say this mountain is short, I mean it's short by the standards of mountains. It's short relative to the class of mountains. When I say this tree is tall, I mean it's tall relative to the class of trees. Um, so, um, um, everyone is a relativist about tallness, <laughs> right? No one thinks there's a, just a question about, but is it really tall? <laughs> is it absolutely tall? That's the opposite of relative. Tall, not compared to anything, but just tall, right? No one believes that about the predicate tall. But about good, a lot of people believe that. You know, that there's a question, is it good for me? Is it good for you? But then there's a question, but is it really good? Is it absolutely good? And Hobbes doesn't believe that. He believes there's a hidden relation every time I say the word good. And in particular, he believes that the relation is always to the desire of the speaker. So when I say it's good, again, I mean it's good for me. When you say it's good, you mean it's good for you, meaning you desire it. And um, there's still one way there could be something that you could call absolutely good, right? So relative is the opposite of absolute. This is, you know, this, this is true in general, right? Like if you're reading Hegel someday <laughs> and you see him talking about the absolute and absolute this and absolute that and it's very mysterious, uh, not that Hegel is easy or anything, but it will help with that to remember that absolute is not just the opposite of relative. All right, so anyway, like there is still one way left. There could be something like an absolute good, which would be if there's something that we all desire. Now note, that doesn't mean, like let's say we all desire cake. That's, that's no good because 
you know, what that really means is I desire for me to have cake. You desire for you to have cake, <laughs> right? So I say, it's good for me to get the cake. <laughs> you say, no, it's good for me to get the cake, <laughs> right? So that doesn't qualify. It has to be something we all desire in common. And Hobbes says there's almost nothing like that. And therefore, when I say good, I almost always mean something different from what you mean when you say good. Later on, he's going to argue that there is one thing that we all desire in common, and therefore that in a certain way can be called absolutely good, and that one thing is peace. So that's going to be very important in, next, in the reading for Tuesday. But in general, it's not true. In general, if I desire something, that means I want it for me and not for you. <laughs> Our desires conflict with each other. And um, therefore, what we... It, and it's important to understand, it's not that I'm lying or something. When I say it's good for me to get the cake, that's completely true because good means that I desire it. <laughs> When you say it's good for me to get the cake, that's completely that can also be completely true because that means you desire it. We're not really contradicting each other then when we each say those things, but we are going to fight each other to see who gets the cake. <laughs> At least that's what will happen in the state of nature. We don't disagree about what's true and what's false. It's not a theoretical disagreement. It's a practical disagreement about what should happen next. Okay. So much for good. <laughs> Are there questions about good and evil? <laughs> I mean, it's really important to remember this to, when it, to, in order to read Hobbes carefully, because when he talks about good later on, it's sometimes going to be easy to forget that this is what good means according to him. Um, and therefore, he'll seem to be saying something different than he really is, if you pay attention. He's already advised you in advance that you have to pay careful attention to definitions. He thinks that's the basis of all knowledge. He also knows that most people don't pay attention to definitions. So if there's something he wants to say to people who can understand him and not to people who can't understand him, a fine way is to... Um, um, make a definition which he knows that some people will forget. <laughs> but you don't want to be one of those people. <laughs> right, so... Um, uh, all right, so that's as far as good goes. Now, as far as the will goes, what is the will, according to Hobbes? Well, according to Hobbes, the will is the end of deliberation. And by end here, I mean not end in some fancy philosophy sense, like the telos or something, but literally the last thing in a deliberation. So a deliberation is some way we have of bringing one of those internal motions to the point where it can be amplified into actually moving our body. Right, so inside my brain, certain things are moving around. That's the deliberation. <laughs> There's certain small motions going on in there. And when the deliberation ends, the last one of those motions is the one that will get amplified and turned into a motion of my own. <laughs> I'm not looking that healthy in that picture, but anyway. <laughs> right. So, um, uh, Hobbes says that's all we mean by the will. The, to will something is to have a desire. But of course, not all desires result in action. To will something is to have a desire that results in action. Um, uh, but 
of um, in order to result in action, the desire must emerge from a process of deliberation, whether short or long. So um, what is the process of deliberation like? That's what you have to understand to understand what the deal is with the FFRs. So here's one way you could understand a process of deliberation. I have various desires and aversions. I'm trying to decide which one to act on. I mean, in a sense, that's just the same thing as saying I'm deliberating. That's what deliberating means. I'm trying to decide which one to act on. So how could you understand trying to decide which one to act on? Well, you can imagine that I'm comparing them to something else that isn't one of my desires or aversions. I'm comparing them to some external standard. Um, And you might call that external standard at least the rule of reason, or at least what I think is the rule of reason, because my reason can go astray. Um, this is what's at the basis of the scholastic or Aristotelian definition that um, Hobbes makes fun of when they define will as a rational appetite, right? What they, they, they really agree with Hobbes that will is an appetite that emerges from deliberation, but they understand deliberation as a process of trying to compare my desires to the rule of reason to see which one I should act on. Um, but Hobbes doesn't think there's an absolute standard anywhere that I can compare my desires or aversions to. That's what we just finished saying about good, right? In other words, if I'm trying to, use, to compare my actions to some rule or norm, um, that's, um, in order to decide which one is right or good, according to Hobbes, that doesn't make sense because good just means that I desire it. So of course, what I, whatever I desire is good <laughs> to get, to have happen that's what good means. <laughs> so there can't be a process like that according to Hobbes. So what is the process like? Well Hobbes says, this is chapter 6 section 50. No, actually I'm not going to go into that. So um, um, Hobbes says that this is a process of balancing my desires and aversions off each other. And it happens by alternating desire and aversion, right? So basically, like, first I imagine certain consequences of the action, and that makes me desire to do the action. But then I imagine further consequences, and they give me an aversion to doing the action. But then I imagine further consequences, and they give me a desire, right? So the process of deliberation is this, like, alternating between desire and aversion. Hobbes says that all animals do this. It's not only rational animals. They, they, you know, when it's, it's never entirely clear what all the consequences of an action are gonna be. So there's always room for this going back and forth between desire and aversion. But at some point, something brings that process to an end, like there's no more time for it, <laughs> for example. And at that point, I'm stuck with the final desire or aversion that emerged from that process. And that's my will. So this shows pretty clearly why my will is not free, why it doesn't even make sense to ask whether it's free. 
if by that you mean not caused by something else or something like that, Hobbes thinks that makes no sense. My will is caused by whatever caused these motions and whatever ended these motions, which must be another motion, right? Because nothing can cause or resist a motion but some other motion. So there were some motions in my brain that were pushing each other, and eventually, you know, at first there was this these small motions moving back and forth, and then there was something that pushed that and made it stop, and the last one that survived made it out to my limb and made me move, and that was my will. And where did these motions come from? Well, they came from other motions that were before them, and ultimately from things that affected my senses. Um, or maybe to some original motions that were put in me when I was born, you know, by my parents' bodies. But those also came from other motions and et cetera, right? So, um, so a voluntary act is an act that results from this kind of process within me. Um, and it's, and Hobbes thinks there's an important difference between voluntary acts and involuntary acts, but the difference is doesn't have anything to do with um, not being caused by an alien cause or something like that. There is no such thing as a free act in that sense, according to Hobbes. Okay, so much for will. I have only a few minutes left to discuss the most important one, I think, which is power. So Hobbes defines power. This is chapter 6, paragraph 57. Oh, no, sorry, this is chapter... 10, paragraph 1. Okay, that makes more sense. On page 50, maybe I'll actually show this to you. The power of a man to take it universally is his present means to obtain some future apparent good. Present means to obtain some future apparent good. So a future apparent good means um, the apparent future satisfaction of my desires and aversions. Because that's what good means, right? So um, that is getting what I desire and avoiding what I have an aversion to. Um, so the future apparent good means that um, um, a means to a future apparent good means um, something I can use in such a way that it will apparently bring about the satisfaction of my desires and aversions. Um, it's, um, I'm putting it that way because, see, it's, the apparent really is in a kind of misleading position. And it's partly because this is a traditional definition that Hobbes is putting his own meaning on. So you might think a future apparent good meant something that's going to happen in the future that appears to be good, but maybe it's not really good. Um, but again, Hobbes doesn't believe in things that only appear to be good and are not really good. Because if, I des if it appears to be good, that means I desire it. And if I desire it, it's good. 
So the apparent really goes kind of like outside of future good. It really means an apparent future good. Something that, um, so the power is a means that I can, that apparently will, pro will provide me with what I desire. Now, why am I going on so long about this, especially when there's only a few minutes left? Well, because um, um, the reason it's a future, it's always a future apparent good. Why not define power as the means to provide me with a future good, period? Why apparent good? So the answer is that um, we can never predict the future with certainty. I mean, again, Hobbes thinks that we have certain knowledge of relations of cause and effect. Those are absolutely certain because they follow by definition. But he says that knowledge is always conditional, right? It always tells us if this, then that, right? So that if then is absolutely certain, but the, but the, the, the then part is only certain if the if part is certain. And the if part is a matter of fact that we only know through the senses and we can never be certain about. Right? So I can be certain that if the bodies are arranged in such and such and such and such a way, um, and I do this to them, I'll get cake. <laughs> but I can't be certain, ever be certain that the bodies really are arranged that way. That part's only probability. So even if I know I desire the cake, I never know that the means I have is a means to getting it. Right, there's a good question. So what if the thing that you desire is something that's like drugs that are not good for you? So, um, this, this is an old question that goes back to a question that Epicurus also faces, right? If the good is the pleasant, does that mean that whatever is pleasant now, however disastrous it will be in the future, that's the good? Oh, wouldn't they then just be apparently good? Um, so this is how I think Hobbes understands that. If you really kept in mind everything that's going to happen, you would not desire it. Um, So in that sense, it's an error to desire it. Um, but um, in other words, um, what good would mean to a person with foresight in my situation is different than what good means said by me. Um, I don't think he would agree that I'm wrong, that, that I'm, that it's, that I'm saying something false when I say it's good. Um, but it's hard to be sure. Um, that's what I get out of his definitions anyway, which she says we're supposed to be able to use. Um, but yeah, it's a good question and maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> um, you know, whether I, let me go on a little bit. Oops, I'm out of time. All right. I'm going to have to talk about this next time then, because it's important because I mean, the consequence I want to draw out of this, I think is right. Even if I'm wrong about what apparent good means, which is that, um, 
because you never are sure of the whole sequence of future circumstances, um, most of what you desire actually is more power. Again, right? That is, power is the means to, to get some future good, but um, um, because you can never be sure what you're actually going to face in the future, most of what you're trying to do is get yourself more means in case things go bad. So, you know, only a little bit of your desire is focused on things that you will be immediately pleasant to you, like cake. And most of it is um, focused on hedging your bets to make sure, like, that, for example, if you do get a cake, you have the means to keep other people from taking it. All right, but I will talk about that more next time, and I will see you then. Yes, I was smelling the cake. <laughs> That's why I kept talking about a cake. Where is the thing? There, there's the cake. All right. <laughs> okay, and on that note, <laughs> I'll oh, see you. Oh, I have a quick question. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, um, I just got into the class like yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to do the readings for today's lecture, but I'm going to do them right now. Um, and I was looking at the syllabus, and I'm a little confused with the notation that you used. Yeah. Um, the, okay. There's actually a footnote there on the syllabus about the notation, but um, although if you're looking, yeah, what's the question? Oh, I might be looking on the website and not the PDF version. It should be um, on the website too, not on the mobile version, maybe. Yeah. Oh, is sense. is the question about these symbols? Uh, yeah, and then also the um, one of them. Uh, like a, it was like a one and then there was a three on the top. Here, I can write it down. I don't look like, <laughs> like that. I can't, hold on a second. Maybe that was probably the footnote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably says section one, and then... Yeah. Yeah, that was probably the footnote you are saying. All right, yeah, so um, this this symbol means section. I, this, this, you know, it's not exactly right. Maybe I should have used the paragraph symbol. These are really paragraph numbers. Um, but anyway, um, in, in this... Let me spotlight myself again. In this edition, the, which again, I think is the same one that's on reserve at the library, the paragraphs are numbered. So uh, actually, in fact, let me just, uh, there you can see, you know, the number in brackets before the paragraph. Should have used the document camera for this. Well, anyway. Um, but they, they have a label on it. Okay. I thought it yeah. Was if in in other editions they might not be numbered and you might have to count them, I guess. <laughs> but well, I'll look for that edition then. Okay. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So on that note, I'll see everyone next week. Bye.